Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Gary has over 45 years of experience beginning in electric utility, where he worked in engineering, line operations, corporate consulting, and training roles. He later joined Ernest & Young Consulting as a senior manager in strategy and transformation. He has had his own consulting practice for over 15 years, focusing on complexity thinking and safety. He regularly contributes to safetydifferently.com. And he's a trained Kinevin facilitator and has worked with BC Hydro and the BC government to apply a sense maker to safety management. And so I'm really pleased to have him here today. And over to you, Gary. Actually, well, thank you, Natalie. For the, and so let me start by sharing my screen with you. Last month, I got to attend your in-person session, so I had the pleasure of meeting some of you. As Natalie says, I've been involved with Kinevin Framework for about 15 years. A lot of it has been on the focus on safety. I have a chapter with then VP Vice President Michael Sheveldave, where we wrote a chapter in the book, Kinevin, Weaving Sense Making the Fabric of the World. And of course, we wrote our chapter on how do we lead safety and use the Kinevin approach there. I was introduced to the Society of Decision Professionals by NASLI a few months ago, back in March. We had connected on LinkedIn and shared some interest in the Kinevin framework. Immediately after agreeing to be with you today, I did some homework and read about this 2023 annual conference and mini workshop. If anybody's attended this workshop, I'd like to learn if my presentation is going to duplicate, reinforce, or possibly conflict with the workshop materials. Just as much as you're here to learn, I want to learn from you guys as well. I also had a peek at the SDP certifications offered and key area requirements. I was somewhat limited, though, to what I could see, so it's quite conceivable some of the decision analysis tools I'm going to show are well known to you. This is my agenda. I've chunked it out into three parts. First part is, where are you today? Second is, what's in your DA toolkit? And the third part is, when do you use Kinevin and what applications are best used for it? Kinevin is a decision-making framework. To explain its origins, I'm going to start with another frame, and this is the evolution of business practices. In 1994, Charles Handy introduced S-curves. These are paradigms that show the life cycle of solutions. So let's start way back in the 1900s, where we applied 400-year-old sciences such as math, physics, chemistry, and scientific management gave us business structure and function. Where did it come from? Well, at that time, it was really only from the church and the military. Then, as in the 1950s, we saw the decline of this reductionistic approach. That led to a rise of a new concept bubble, systems thinking, using an engineering approach. Now, those yellow bubbles that you see, these are when crises occur, where you've got something new coming up because something old doesn't work. In systems thinking, we had decision analysis. That was coined in 1964. Then we also had practices such as lean, business process reengineering. They were created in that era as well. However, systems thinking struggled to address real-world phenomena such as emergence, self-organization. This led to a birth of a new holistic science, complexity science. Instead of an engineering approach, we shifted to looking at ecology. Now we have in our vernacular terms such as going viral, tipping point, complex adaptive systems, adjacent possible. But let's have a closer look. What do we mean by cognitive complexity? Cognition is about thinking, learning, memory, and how we handle knowledge. There's been a few myths out there that we've been hanging on for a lot longer than we should have. Oh, the brain is a computer. It's hardwired, logical, information processing, machine. But what have we learned from cognitive neuroscience? We've learned that we need to think more like humans, not like machines. We also learned that brains aren't designed to store and retrieve information. The brain is built to recognize patterns. And we can use that power to identify what we call weak signals in an uncontrollable environment. Another myth busted is that humans are not rational thinkers. 
As an engineer, this kind of startled me because I like to believe that I use reason, facts, and evidence to make solid decisions. Well, the new thinking is that we make decisions based on emotional reactions and heuristic shortcuts. Because we seldom have perfect information, we are forced to rely on the subjective heart, not the objective head, to make the final decision. This map of the complexity of sciences is not meant to be an eye test, but just shows you how things have been evolving. If you compare this to the classical sciences, which have been around for over 400 years, complexity science is still in the embryonic stage. Heck, it was only 40 years ago that the Santa Fe Institute coined the term complex adaptive system. If you look closely, you can see there's this little red box on the map. Everybody can see that? This is where we play. It's a big field there. We can't play everywhere, and we've kind of picked where we want to play. And when I say we, I talk about the work that Dave Snowden has been doing. In a nutshell, we look at the human aspects of complex adaptive systems. It's a transdisciplinary approach, and Dave calls it anthrocomplexity. We learn from anthropology, especially the field of ethnography, and the study of human culture. Cognitive science, which I already talked about, well, that's how the brain makes decisions. And then we also look at natural sciences, understanding repeatable patterns that occur in the natural environment. Ontological awareness is determining what type of system you're in. In the real world, there are various ways to categorize systems. One commonly used way, base it on behavior and what type of knowledge is present. This is a single plane diagram of the three basic systems, order, complex, and chaos. You also hear order called deterministic and chaos referred to as stochastic. These three systems are not mutually exclusive. You can move around between systems just by changing your thinking, your paradigms. The only one that you gotta be careful about is this border between chaos and order. This is a physical cliff that you can plunge down to chaos. It looks kind of weird, but if you can think of a piece of paper folded over to form an edge that you can fall over, that's what it represents. Some of you may have heard the term edge of chaos. Well, that's the edge of chaos. And if you're familiar with the idea of systems within systems, we can talk about the diagram as a framework with three subsystems being nested in a bigger complex adaptive system. I'm pretty sure that everyone in the session is familiar and comfortable in the order system. This is where most of our formal education, training, and systems thinking has taken place. As an engineer at UBC, that's what I just learned about, things in the ordered system. And we like it because it's certain, it's predictable, and stable. If we do this, then we get that. We play with known knowns, known unknowns, which we call risk, and unknown knowns. These are things you don't know, but someone else does. We also call this tacit knowledge, unwritten things that only exist in a person's brain. And sometimes you spend tons of time trying to extract that knowledge and make it explicit by documentation. Now, contrast that to a complex system. We can reduce complicated problems into manageable components. Think of Lego bricks. But we can't break down complex problems. Think of mayonnaise. We can't separate out the vinegar, the oil, the water, or the ingredients. It's also irreversible. With Lego bricks, you can put it together. If you don't like assembly, you can take them apart. Same as fixing a car. You can put it together or take it apart. With mayonnaise, once you got mayonnaise, that's it. We have to work with the whole. Otherwise, we would ignore new properties that emerge. In mayonnaise, what's that? Well, that's flavor. That's taste. That's smell. Where the heck do these come from? These are emergent properties from a complex system. That's why in complexity, we say the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Well, that sounds like a real bummer. It also means we can take a small piece, and we call that a fractal, to accurately represent the whole. A spoonful of mayonnaise tastes like the whole jar. And that's what we actually do in a Monte Carlo simulation. We generate random numbers or sampling techniques, and we base it on fractal patterns. In the third system, chaos, everything is random and variable. 
In our framework definition, entering chaos is unexpected. It's always a surprise. If you enter from order, it's that plunge down the cliff with major consequences. If the consequences are negative, it's an accident, an injury, or worse, a fatality. If unknowables or unimaginables are factors, we have Taleb's black swans. If consequences are positive, we call that serendipity. Examples of serendipity include the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming when he accidentally left out a petri dish overnight. Next morning, he goes there and sees this mold going, and what the heck was that? It's also how the microwave oven was developed and the invention of post-it notes. These are accidents that have really wonderful outcomes. But let's take this single plane diagram and let's improve on it. Let's make the following additions. Let's split order into two domains. We'll call them complicated and clear. And then we'll put one in the middle. We'll call that confused. Confused is the state of not knowing where you are. This is the Kinevin framework. To get the language right, it's not a two by two model with five quadrants. No, we talk about domains. With Kinevin, you can describe where you are in the present. Like I said before, it's a sense-making framework to support decision-making. We make sense of the present so we can understand how to act in different contexts. The way that we solve problems and make decisions is different depending on the domain you are in. If you're in the clear, anyone can solve problems with a bit of training. We have rigid constraints, such as best practices, which mean there's only one answer, and this is what you're supposed to do. So workers simply learn how to sense, categorize, and respond, and they comply with the rules. When there could be more than one right answer, or perhaps there's no answer, we require experts in the complicated domain. What experts do in the complicated domain, they sense, they analyze, and they respond, usually with a good or maybe an optimal solution. And then they create governing constraints, such as policies, standards, or guidelines, and they take them down to the people in the clear domain to implement. In the complex domain, we need to better understand the problem. So the method there is probe, we sense, mainly to learn. And we use enabling constraints. Hmm, enabling constraints. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? A simple example is a team tasked to explore an opportunity. A leader may select the people, or better, Confirm that people want to self-organize into a small team. So resources are provided and the team is given a time deadline. These constraints enable the team to go to work. In the chaotic domain, we need to escape quickly, especially if it's a catastrophe or a disaster. So we act, we sense what has changed, and then we respond. One response is to stabilize the situation, which then moves us into the confused domain. For example, during my time running line crews at BC Hydro, when a car crashed into a power pole, the first thing we did was stabilize the situation by making the site safe, making sure that the energized lines were de-energized, put up the safety barriers, checking for any personal injuries. By shifting into the confused domain by stabilizing, we bought time to figure out what to do next. In the confused domain, you choose to either move into another domain or you choose to wait it out and watch others. A lot of people think that they're in a constant state of chaos. Have you not heard that? I don't know. I am just in a state of chaos. I just really I don't know what's going on. I would agree if they were facing immediate harm that could do physical damage. Otherwise, <laughs> they're really in the confused domain and they're just befuddled, feeling trapped, not knowing what to do next. The federal government lists the Kinevin framework as a leading and uncertainty approach. The framework shown in the job aid is an early version, really needs an update. On the right side, you'll see the European Commission, which is part of the executive of the European Union. Together, Dave Snowden has co-developed a field guide to navigate crises using Kinevit. This document is available as a free download. So that's a brief description of what Kinevin framework is. Sometimes we just say Kinevin to shorten it. And then, like I said, it's there to describe various events and activities where they belong. This is a map of COVID-19. I plotted various pandemic actions that reside in each domain. In the clear domain, 
These are the things that anyone can do. We learn how to social distance. We learn how to wear masks. And for safety, we learn how to put on PPE, personal protective equipment. Other things are in that clear domain as well. Panic hoarding and civic lockdown and even self-isolation. This is where the conspiracy theorists live. I'm showing where the experts reside. They're the people in the complicated domain. They're the people like the country health officers. They're the ones that are operating the dashboards, keeping a handle and tracking how the disease is spreading or being mitigated. This is also where we have myths, hoaxes, fake news. These are people that maybe call themselves experts, but they're really not. That's why I got it located down close to the confused domain, because I don't know about you guys, but I read some of the stuff, but I, it really confuses me what they're doing. I've got working remotely in red, basically spanning the complicated and complex domain. Organizations are trying to figure out how to work best under a new normal. And they're having to try to put some things in place structurally, but then they don't know if it works. So they move into the complex and then they move back. So that's why it's on the boundary. You can see all the things in the complex domain that have been going on to really wrestle COVID-19 to the ground. A lot of the companies right now are looking at how do we shape the next normal? What is the next normal? Gone the chaotic. We've had those violent attacks, protests, riots, and looting. Just going back to that example of COVID-19, do you mind explaining why you have a couple of things that sound to me similar in different domains? For example, like what, how are conspiracy theorists nuanced from fake news and hoaxes type folks? Like why are they in different domains? Okay. Now, when you look at mapping, mm -hmm. Positioning elements has a lot of significance. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy theorists are way down in the bottom right because as far as they're concerned, it's clear to them, mm. right? Everything is wrong, wrong, wrong. We're the ones that only have the right message. That's it, okay? Just like you've got in the complicated, in the top right, you would have all the real experts, the scientists running dashboards and looking at those sort of things, being experts in the field. And the myths and hoaxes, they look like it's expert information, but it's really not. Mm. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Sure. Okay. I started to play around, and you can do this as well, it's, it's quite fun. I started to play around with different types of maps. I tried to put this one together to talk to my finance and economic buddies, because I think what we needed to do is have some way to understand what's happening. The Kinevin framework is really good for that, because I can just do like we just did, Nasli. Let me put conspiracy theorists way down here. And some go, why is it down there? And you can have that conversation, discussion. Oh, that's it. Well, why don't we move it here? You can do that because you've got something you can talk towards. It's a map you can look at and discuss different things and you get different perspectives as well. When I hear, let's think out of the box or get out of the box, well, what is the box? I believe the box is the ordered system formed by governing and rigid constraints. And what are those constraints? Well, they're typically they're human imposed, like regulations, policies, standards, processes, rules, best practices, all those are basically in the box. Notice that there's some items touching or maybe outside the box. They involve multiple interconnections with the complex and chaos systems. Let's now take a look at what's in your toolkit. I'll do that by talking about what's in my toolkit, plus a few fairly new complex tools I've just added. Let's start down the clear domain. People are trained, tested, perhaps certified to perform routine tasks. And when they make decisions, they sense, they categorize, they respond. They've seen it before and can trust their gut based on past experiences. And the brain's really good at this. The brain can process extremely quickly. Daniel Kahneman in his book, he calls this thinking fast. Thinking fast is first fit pattern matching. It uses the power of the brain as a pattern recognizer. The brain is also very energy efficient. So doing a repetitive task means it can operate at a lower energy level. And why do I say first fit? Because as humans, we're lazy. Once we find the first solution and we satisfy, we probably move on to something else. 
We can think fast because there's only one right answer. When more than one right answer is possible, our thinking changes to slow. In neuroscience, thinking slow is called novelty receptive processing. We now look at decision criteria, identify alternatives, rank them, and maybe do some risk mitigation. I was exposed to this must and wants approach when I took a Kept Retrieval course in 1971. What I'm showing on the screen here it happens to be Kept Retrieval's iPad app. It was the same training I found out that NASA engineers were receiving. In 1970, when NASA engineers heard, Houston, we have a problem, they used critical thinking skills to help bring Apollo 13 back home. In 1990, when I was at Hydro, I headed up a department called Business Management Education. We developed a course on project management based on DA principles. We also delivered business case preparation courses for Hydro managers. And what do we use? We use Kepner Trigo critical thinking skills. Two decades later, I was asked by TELUS to do something similar for their customer solutions delivery managers. And I was able to reuse and refresh tools already in my toolkit. Before we leave the clear domain, I just want to draw your attention to one more really interesting model. This is the recognition primed decision model, RPD. This is Gary Klein's model to explain how commanders on the ground under fire make good decisions within seconds. You may not have time to think slow or certain situation prevents careful evaluation. RPD combines two processes. It's first of all, pattern matching to match the current situation to ones encountered in the past, which identifies reasonable courses of action. And then an evaluator process using mental simulation to imagine how that option would play out and to see if it's going to work. It's a model that's been around for a long time and it still has a lot of traction. In the complicated domain, I have in my toolkit, project management and lean tools. I use them as an expert when making complicated domain decisions. These often are used in conjunction with change management methods such as Cotter, ProSci. I was trained on Daryl Connors managing at the speed of change when we dabbled in BPR at BC Hydro and later as a senior manager at Ernst & Young Consulting. In the complicated domain, we have if-then causal relationships. But in the complex domain, we have dispositionality. If-then relationships may or may not exist, or maybe they're hidden, or maybe they will suddenly change. For decision professionals, it requires a paradigm shift. You shift from being an expert consultant to be a humble complexity facilitator. I can hear you thinking, oh, you want me to do what? Hey, this isn't easy to comprehend nor to do. So let me introduce a leadership metaphor provided by Warren Bennis. As a decision professional, you are an expert managing, building, and fixing things. You are a mechanic working in the complicated domain. There's your tools that you've got on your tool bag. However, in the complex domain, you switch to be a gardener carrying a water can, seeds, fertilizer. These are the nurturing tools you pick up as a leader and complexity facilitator. This is not an either or, but a both and. What we want in our DA toolkit is both set of tools. And then we can apply Kinevin to understand for the current situation and context if we should be a mechanic or we should we be a gardener. This is a notion of bounded applicability. We need to be careful that we don't inadvertently use a hammer to nail a screw. And over my career, I've seen lots of that happening. You don't realize you do it because we get so good at using a hammer, everything looks as a nail. We just got to be careful about that. What decision analysis tools are available for the complex domain? Let's start with the most often used and maybe well-known, I'm assuming it's well-known, I could be wrong, analytic hierarchy process, or AHP. Why does AHP reside in the complex domain? It's because it follows principles of designing interventions in the complex system. We want a level of granularity that allows us to experience system change. This means trying to tackle big things like world peace, global climate change, that's really too coarse. And perhaps it's why maybe we struggle on this planet trying to make changes. Where we can be more effective is if we can work at a more granular level, a lower level, like a community, like a company, 
where people are able to act because they can better address the what's in it for me question. EHP involves many people acting autonomously with no fear of somebody just filtering or distorting their choices. This is diversity. Diversity is a phenomenon of complexity science. The term distributed cognition is simply that idea of wisdom of crowds. Why do we think that the top knows everything? Why don't we distribute that throughout the organization? The third thing that we want is discharge mediation. If I showed a bar chart and saying, well, the employee satisfaction is a six out of 10. I knew what six was. It was somebody that probably had a really good 10 experience and a really bad two experience. And so when they gave a score, they just average it and give six. This is how we end up with scores in the middle all the time. What we want to do in complexity is capture the 10, capture the two, and don't have them filtered by another person. That somebody else come in and say, there, oh, I know what that person's talking about. I've been there before. That's a load of crock, isn't it? How can that person be in there before? It's only you that knows what it is. You're the only authentic voice. Pairwise comparison is just basically creating choices that people can then select. I like A more than B, but not as much as C. There's been a lot of articles and journals and videos on using AHP. Here's just a couple I just picked out. Last month, I remember there was a brief discussion about parents teaching their kids DA skills. Well, look at iPhone. There's an article about doing that, helping young adults with financial decision making using an AHP approach. And I recall also we talked a bit about sustainability. And I just did a quick Google and I found this one using AHP for that. This one may be worthwhile to have a peek at. It's an overview of the applications. One of the downsides of EHP is that it takes a lot of time to complete. What do you do when you don't have the time? You do what most people do. You apply heuristics. These are just these mental shortcuts that follow simple, efficient rules. We see them in nature all the time. Birds flocking, fish and bees swarming. They follow simple rules. Follow the next bird or fish. Match your speed, avoid collision. I've been reading that engineers developing self-driving vehicles are deploying these heuristic rules, learning what nature has already figured out in natural sciences, applying that to our own human systems. George Zingerger studies heuristics in decision-making. He says sports players consciously or unconsciously follow a simple heuristic. One, just fix your gaze on the ball. Two, Make sure you maintain the angle as you run into the direction of the ball. Three, catch the ball. Remember that uh, miracle on the Hudson? Well, the gaze and heuristic was applied by U.S. Airways pilot Chesley Sully Sullinger in January 2009 when he deliberately crashed flight 1549 into the Hudson River. What did he do? He just fixed his gaze on the tower at the airport. He adjusted his speed so the angle of the gaze remained constant. And then when he realized that the tower was rising in the windshield, he knew that he was not going to make it to the airport for a dry landing. It was an easy decision for him to ditch the plane into the water. Humans use heuristics to manage uncertainty. Consider these three simple statements every U.S. Marine is taught in basic training. These are not a promise the soldier will survive in the fog of military war, but the chances of living are increased. By the way, these are not just catchy sayings or platitudes. Each rule is hard and measurable. Did we capture the high ground? Yes or no. Did we stay in touch? Did we keep moving? An interesting study on the Crips street gang discovered heuristics that are used in the fog of street gang warfare. Again, simple, easy to remember, measurable. A complex tool recently I added is narrative mapping. I say recent because of advances in computer hardware and software. I'm curious, does your client or organization have an anthropologist on board? Or maybe you're contemplating hiring an ethnographer? I did a Google Ngram search on the word ethnography. Interest has certainly picked up over the last few years. So tell me, does your brain recognize there's a pattern emerging here? And would you say that this may be a weak signal that you should be paying attention to? If you like to do a lot of reading, I'll suggest a couple that you could put on your summer reading list, particularly on Jillian Tett's book. 
she has a very interesting view on how business and life should look through the lens of storytelling. Personally, I've been intrigued by Robert Schiller's book, Narrative Economics. Here's another one for your summer list. It's how stories go viral and drive major economic events. A very recent illustration on a smaller scale is Apple's share price fluctuation. In anticipation of their augmented reality headset, Apple climbed to a record high just before that June 5th announcement. And then when we saw a big sell-off, see that big red candle going down? What happened? Well, stock analysts suggest that was due to the headset's $3,500 price tag. And the immediate reaction to the Apple's Vision Pro presentation was so-so, or negative opinions from a few key media writers. And there's plausibility that the bad stories went viral and drove the price down. This is the somebody told somebody who told somebody and so on. And before you know it, people are selling the stock. We're storytellers. And we're naturally good at it. We share stories at work and at home. That's how family traditions and rituals are passed down from generation to generation. These are patterns formed by stories. And as I showed earlier, we know that cognitive science research, the human brain is not designed to read and write documents. The power of the brain is the ability to recognize patterns. And we can see the patterns that are formed by stories. I'm going to make an assumption that everybody knows what big data is. This is the data that is produced from ERP systems like Oracle and SAP. But have you heard of the term thick data coined by ethnographer Trisha Wang? Big data is terrific because it can answer the who, the when, the where, the what question. Thick data answers the why question. When you interview people, you are gathering thick data. You're hearing context in terms of deep feelings and emotions. What's it like to work here? Well, then you start hearing about rituals and values and symbols and who are the heroes that we look up to in our organization. With stories, we can go below the waterline into the org culture. But it's just a glimpse of the org culture because as you all know, interviewing people one-on-one -on -one or even one-on group takes a lot of time. If we could scale and collect a large sample of thick data, and by that sample, I'm going to include anyone and everyone from frontline to C-suite, because CEOs have stories as well, anywhere, anytime, 24-7, 365. We would have what Dave Stone calls rich data. And then with all this rich data, we would have a much greater understanding of the art culture. And when we make a decision, we will have an informed sense of how it will impact a culture. We're now able to use the internet with cloud computing to stream online data quickly using data visualization software. There are several software narrative inquiry tools. This is the one I'm most familiar with. It's called SenseMaker, developed by Dave Snowden at Cognitive Edge, now a Kinevin company. It's a cycle that you follow. The first one is that you do a design you build a collector and people use it to enter their stories as personal ethnographers. They can share their experiences, narratives, voice recordings, pictures, drawings, and sketches, either the desktop computer or on their mobile device. And they can do it on their own time. This methodology has been tested and proved over a decade and is still widely used. Countries, cities, companies, government, nonprofits, military communities, Use it at BC Hydro. Last year, we did it at the BC government here. Some past examples globally include citizens in Singapore, children in a community, patients in a university, medical hospital, American soldiers in Afghanistan. In the analysis and sense-making step, this is where we have decision makers facilitated by decision professionals who are able to look at the patterns in traditional graphs and bar charts. But here's an advantage that SenseMaker offers. How would you respond if somebody looked at that bar chart and said, Gary, what are the improvement opportunities in that last bar down below? I know in the past, I would say, I don't know. I don't have the details for that. It's too coarse, in other words. What would I say today? I don't know. But let's go and find out. I click on the bottom bar and the experiences entered by the storytellers pop up. And then the decision makers can read them and get context, more understanding 
oh, this is where we need to improve and get better. And all this is done interactively. You think that would grab the attention of decision makers? It's like watching the war in Ukraine right now, where you've got maps and you're looking at instantaneously, what is the situation on the battlefield? People reporting back in real time before the decision makers can decide what's the next move for the counteroffensive. The graphic shown above the bar chart is the narrative map. Let's look at that. This is where I get a bit excited. Because what SenseMaker can do is generate 2D contour maps from the rich narrative data. Each dot that you see there on this map is a narrative. It's a story. The eyes are quickly drawn to the clusters that appear in the landscape. Clusters mean that there's a lot of similar stories being told. In this particular plot, I've got on the x-axis a measure of totally fearful of retribution to extremely comfortable. And if you turn your head sideways, you can see on the y-axis, in their experience, did they bend the work to comply with the rules, or did they bend the rules to get the work done? If you show this to decision makers, they start scratching their head and going, I'm really curious. Why are people fearful of retribution? But we also see, too, that there are people feeling good about bending the rules to get work done. This becomes quite useful, particularly when you have to make systemic change. Because these maps help take the guesswork out of where should I make that next change. Mm -hmm. As complex facilitators, we ask three change intervention questions. What system rules might we change so we get fewer stories like those in the red X area? So what's the red X area? That's where people were really fearful and they're bending the work to comply within the rules. Hmm, I don't think we want to do that. That's not a good area. What's a favorable area? This is where we want to go. Well, that's the green check mark. Those are probably experiences, stories shared where people were really, really comfortable being themselves and they're following the rules. In other words, working the plan as it should be. We like to give more of those stories. The arrows point a vector direction. These maps are giving you where you need to make change. Red X to green check mark. And you're using maps that are based on the stories people are telling every day. Can I interrupt you for a sec? I sure. see Andrew has had his hand up for a bit. Okay, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, I'll jump in with a question. I'm just trying to understand that the how you're collecting data and what data you're collecting in this case. So, so if I understand correctly, you're you're collecting information for respondents, maybe asynchronously or synchronously, and, and you're asking, you're are you asking for kind of narrative responses that are qualitative, and then you are interpreting them quantitatively here, or, or you're collecting like a, a quantitative metric and a kind of written or narrative qualitative data as well? Like, like what, what are you actually asking? How are you collecting it? Yeah. Okay. What we do, and let me take you back to this slide here. Okay. When we design in the design phase, we build this collector, which the storytellers can use. And you can see on the little picture showing the mobile app, these are triangles and we have what we call dyads. And what we do is that we ask the storyteller is to share your quick experience. By quick, I mean no more than five minutes. We don't want like two hour Hollywood stories. I went here and this is the situation I found. This is the decision that was made, done. We want you now to tell us about how you feel about what happened there. And what they can do is move around that blue marker to where they feel. Sensebrick collects that narrative data mm -hmm. and then later reproduce what we call a dashboard. One of those things that we could show on the bar chart. Yeah, so Gary, I have put that SenseMaker sample that you created before into the chat. Andrew, you're yep. welcome to check it out. Basically, yep. if I can reiterate what Gary said, the participants are basically self-ethnographers where they describe the situation very briefly and then they move the cursor around to try to qualitatively and quantitatively locate where they would put place that experience. So you can play with that sense maker sample in the chat. Andrew, is that okay? Yeah. And, and, and so like I understand the kind of how you're collecting the data and how you're you're, you're essentially you're you're within the diet, spatially locating it, that becomes the numbers on your axes that you're plotting in that. Yeah. And then is it, 
is it asynchronous or, or are you saying, okay, everyone by next Tuesday noon, everyone's got to do this, or, or you're expecting dynamic people to just add stories as, as they have observations? It varies on the project that you've got. If you want to use SenseMaker as a survey, you can do that. We find we get more benefit if we look upon this tool as a journaling document. So you're always adding stories. This is why we want to make it very mobile. One engineering company, we said to them, you can still do your every end of Friday weekly report, which everybody hates, and spend two hours saying what you've done for the past week. Or every time you make a pretty significant decision, you jump on and then you enter that story and you capture that. What would you like to do? Mm -hmm. The guy says, most of the stuff I do on Friday is garbage. I'll do that immediately. This is what the soldiers in Afghanistan did as well. It got to the point where they had soldiers that were pinned under fire. They were entering what it was like to be pinned under fire. You can't get more real time than that. And this is what you want to have your leaders seeing. What's really happening on the battlefield right now? Let's say you decide to do an intervention and you change something. You can then start collecting immediate feedback. You decided to change rule 42. Well, that sucked. This is why it sucked. Or this is really, really good. Do more of this. So now you're getting fast feedback, which is what you want because you changed something. How, how, how do you incent people to fill in these? Like, obviously, when something new, you might get a bit of a novelty effect, yeah. or you might get people saying, like, I'm not doing this until someone tells me to, yeah. until they see results, I see that decision makers are paying attention. So how, how, do, how does that typically work? Yeah. Really, really good question, Andrew. And a lot of it is, how do you communicate with your people now? What's your experience with past surveys, be it SurveyMonkey, whatever? Yeah, we do our employee satisfaction survey. We never see the data until eight months later. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we don't see it all. So we come along saying, we want you this. They're going, why? Why should I bother? This is how the company culture is. So you're right. We have to shift that. And we're very pointed with the communication team. You've got to give feedback immediately. Yes, whoever reported that the back door is always left open, Thank you for telling us about that because now we fixed the lock. Keep those stories coming on. Or thank you for sharing that bullying story. We're on that. Right? We try to keep everything anonymous because of psychological safety. Mm -hmm. right? But it's going to vary depending on organization. And we have some organizations that have no problem sharing this stuff out. And we have some organizations that are still not quite sure how the leaders are going to use this. So it does vary. That's a really good question though. Thanks. Let me go back to pick it up okay, here. Okay, now, every time I think about navigation, I always think you need a compass direction and you need a map. Well, this is the map and where those arrows are showing is giving you a heading, a direction to go from red X to green. Useful data that you collect might help to reveal really interesting yellow check marks area. What are these? Well, in this particular map, People are very comfortable bending the rules. You may want to look at that if you're a decision maker. Hmm, are they bending the rules, which may lead to unintended negative consequences down the road? Or maybe they've uncovered rules that we really need to change, get rid of, or whatever. Don't know? All we have to do is click the dot, read the stories, and get an idea. Oh, this is what's happening? So again, you're informed to make decisions from the stories that people are sharing. We have a visual map to navigate through uncertainty, unpredictability, and ambiguity. And these are dynamic maps. If you're into using the journaling, every day the map is going to dynamically change and shift. This becomes very useful if you ever want to measure progress. Let's look at your maps three months ago. Let's look at your maps today. Can you see how the maps have shifted and how maybe the red X's have disappeared? Maybe other red X's have shown up but they're all moving towards the green check mark. Here's some other complex domain tools in my bag. Since the future is unpredictable, how do you shape the future? Well, in wayfinding, instead of a mission statement, we might ask, what's the mission question you could ask to engage your workers? Or maybe we reframe the problem as a narrative question. We have operational learning teams. Often, they will probe first to learn before defining what to improve. There's no business case in the complex domain. 
The business case is in the complicated domain of using deductive and inductive reasoning. What we do in the complex domain, we will probe with safe to fail experiments based on abductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning is, don't know for sure, but I'm going to play a hunch. Nudgy from behavior economics, that's just a probe. A nudge is something small, it's non-coercive, that may lead to the emergence of a larger desired behavior. While I was at BC Hydro, I delivered courses in Edward de Bono's lateral thinking, helping people to be more creative and practice something called exaptation. That's the process by which a trait or feature that evolved for one purpose is co-opted and used for a different purpose. We see that in nature. Birds evolved from using feathers from warmth to using them for flying. Henry Ford created the auto assembly line from visiting, of all things, an animal slaughterhouse. He watched how meat was being cut and packaged like that. So what he did is he reversed the process in his car factory. If you have some of these tools in your DA toolkit, I'd be really interested in learning what's working or not working well for you. I'm going to talk a bit about when do you use Kinevin. The Kinevin framework, useful describing the current situation you find yourself in, but the real power of Kinevin is moving around the domains, and we call that Kinevin dynamics. Let's say you're given an incremental improvement assignment. It's highly lucky as a decision professional, you will begin in the complicated domain as an expert. You put on your mechanics hat to sense, analyze, respond, find a solution, and then revise your rules and procedures, then move that down to the clear domain to train the folks impacted by the change. On another assignment, you're appointed to a group to pick the company's new CEO in three weeks. Once again, you will put on your mechanics hat to sense, analyze, and respond. But this time, there's a lot of disagreement and questions with no clear answers. And by the way, you're slowly running out of time. So what do you do next? Well, if everybody's familiar with Kinevin, the decision is, let's move into the complex domain. Running out of time is a good indicator that we seem to be struggling, we're waiting water, we got to move and start exploring. This is where you pull out your gardener's tools and begin to explore and probe. Useful data that you collect might help to reveal hidden patterns about a CEO contender. You bring them back in the complicated domain and update your analysis. This is a premise behind Agile, looping between the complicated and the complex to get the job done. In my prep work, I found this slide to be really fascinating. You're using Agile norms to invite members to actively participate in the evolution of the vision. Well, we know that the first value of the Agile manifesto is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Really what you're doing is the Kinevin Dynamics. You're doing that exploration and just a time transfer loop. You shift from the complicated to the complex to explore opportunities. You gather narrative from the decision makers, key stakeholders, and members. You start thinking and talking out of the box. You start launching seek to fail experiments to learn and adapt. And if you do discover new solutions, you bring them back in the complicated domain. All those words that you got there fit really, really well for me. Describe what you're doing using the Kinevin. We do distinguish between safe-to-fail experiments and pilots. Pilots are in the complicated domain because they're there to fine-tune and agree to a solution before implementation. In our practice, safe-to-fail experiments include conducting deliberate failures. Why do we want to fail? It's because we are probing by disrupting old patterns and monitoring to see what emerges. If it's positive, do more. But if negative unintended consequences emerge, you better either dampen them or abandon them before they go viral and get out of hand. We call them safe to fail because the benefit of learning outweighs the cost of failure. So the last thing I want to mention is robustness and resilience. And it's probably the most important thing when you want to apply to an oven. Robustness emphasizes stability and the ability to take a hit and survive unchanged. While resilience is surviving change, it's fast recovery and improving your operating point. Remember your statistics 101 course? When you learn about the blue curve, we called it the bell, Gaussian, or normal distribution. We could use deductive reasoning since we were working with known knowns. 
Inductive reasoning took us to developing rules to replicate patterns and dealing with known unknowns. We can perform risk assessments using frequency and severity estimates. Then we can apply confidence levels to indicate the chances the sample survey is also true to the population. And we can actually even raise the confidence level if we truncate and ignore the outliers, eh, because they rarely occur. What we're doing there is moving from the probable to the possible on the blue curve. Now compare that with the red curve, which is a Parisian distribution. If you notice, the two curves look similar in the middle, but are vastly different at the extremes. On the right side are events that don't happen often, low frequency, but when they do, they enlarge and have a huge impact. This is the realm of abductive reasoning and dealing with unknown unknowns. We use heuristics, as we talked about, and we make plausible educated guesses or hunches, which may enable new patterns to emerge, now, all this would be a, so what, who cares? Except for the fact that the red curve is more prevalent in the real world than the blue. In 2011, Bill McKelvey released an article that explains when events are completely independent, a bell curve prevails. However, when events are interconnected, a Pareto distribution emerges due to positive feedback loops that tend to amplify small initial conditions. That's how stories go viral in narrative economics. A Pareto curve is referred to as a power law distribution. There are more than 100 power law distributions that have been identified in physics. For example, the frequency and magnitude of earthquakes follow a power law distribution known as the gutenberg Richter law. The distribution of city sizes worldwide follow a power law known as Zipf's law. It states that the population of cities is inversely proportional to their rank. In other words, the largest city is typically twice as populous as the second largest city, three times as populous as the third largest city, and so on. The distribution of wealth in society often exhibits a power law distribution. Some of you will recognize that as the Pareto principle. The Italian noticed that in the late 19th century, 20% of the population controlled 80% of the wealth. With today's fast feedback loops connecting diverse people around the world, I sense that ratio has drastically changed for the worse. To me, it wasn't surprising that we saw the emergence of the 1% movement to address wealth and income inequality. If we plot log-log axes, the power law becomes a straight line. This straight line highlights the presence of rare but extremely large events that statistical methods in the Gaussian world tend to ignore we will see catastrophes more frequently. I've listed some of the global disasters that are hitting us right now. This fat, heavy tail region is a wake-up call for folks in emergency preparation and risk management. You can't plan for all catastrophes since you don't know when or how big. So one decision option, let's buy insurance and cover our losses. Well, insurance companies are interconnected in a pool to share the global disaster bill. And what are the solutions that they're offering? Does anybody like me live in a condo or a townhouse? Have you noticed your annual insurance premiums going way, way high? Or maybe your deductibles, which used to be $10,000, are now $100,000? In California, recently, one insurance company is no longer an issue new policies. As of today, this is how many wildfires are burning in Canada. A new wildfire is a plunge into the Kinevin chaotic domain. We act to get under control, sense if our firefighting efforts are working, and respond accordingly. By the way, a new fire is not a black swan, a total surprise that comes out of nowhere. It's a black elephant. It's a cross between a black swan and the proverbial elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is an important matter that everyone is aware of, but avoids addressing typically due to fear, discomfort, money reasons, other political priorities. It's not like we don't know about wildfires. Ecologists have been warning us, while climate change makes fires more likely, poor forestry management helps them make them more destructive. So what's the implication for decision professionals? If your decision analysis involves systemic change, your starting point is, Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. One more interdependency for decision makers to muse over. Scientists recently reported a relationship between Australian wildfires 
African droughts, and Atlantic hurricanes. The Australian wildfires set up a massive El Nino climate pattern, which led to severe weatherstorms. The wildfires are linked to devastating floods in Pakistan. And remember when we had those heavy rain incidents in Canada? That's when we first learned about these atmospheric rivers. It's all connected. So what's the implication for decision professionals? In my opinion, I think you need to examine where are you investing your time and what you have in your toolkit. And a bigger question is, are you spending your time strengthening robustness? Or are you building resilience? This is a table summarizing what I covered today. In the order side of the Kinevin framework, you are contained. On the complex side, you are connected. A key takeaway is appreciating why you cannot manage, simplify, or control complexity. You have to embrace and navigate through it, learning as you go. And remember, it's both and, not either or. You should have both mechanic and gardening tools in your toolkit, and then practice bounded applicability. Know when to use what tool when. Yeah, is there any questions? I'll, I'll, I'll throw one out. May, part observation, part question. I. I I think part of how decision science, decision analysis, decision quality is evolving without explicit reference to Kinevin, although I think there's Kinevin literacy within our community, if not a lot of practice. I know there are people who kind of use it, but but more literacy than practice is we've shifted from kind of very analytical optimization, kind of the, the math, you know, side of it to more the human side with behavioral economics. And, and now you know, some of the things that, that we're talking about that, you know, the webinar that Dave Madison gave a while back, decision leadership and kind of empathy for the decision maker, more kind of human, I guess, embracing complexity and agile approaches. And, and I, I, I've i not used Kevin in an explicit sense, but I, I see probably when it's a big, big utility being, just as a conceptual map, of understanding those different quadrants and saying, we might be over here, so let's not try to optimize. Mm -hmm. You know, let's try to probe. And I think we still got a ways to go there, even as a profession. In terms of organizations like ours, I think we do things in different spaces, and particularly where we've got innovation or or, or technology development foundations. They, they, they are in a different quadrant and have tools from it, but without explicitly knowing. And I think part of our, our internal tension is because people are, are working with tools optimized for one of those quadrants, but they, we, we don't have that language. So, so people are kind of trying to talk to each other and trying to squash, you know, complex into, into the, you know, they're trying, they're trying to force things into a different quadrant mm -hmm. without ever having that conversation. So we're trying to, we're trying to figure out capital allocation for innovation projects the same way we figured them for like pretty routine reinvestment and sustaining capital mm -hmm. is one of those, those, those challenges. So anyway, that's a few observations. It's quite an interesting yeah, interesting framework. That so, I think Andrew, if I understand to... correctly, what are you suggesting that like the the evolution of thought in this domain is moving towards addressing complexity, except we may not have the language for it. Yeah, like in, in terms of some some of the dialogue, at least within like I, I'm stepping off after two years on the SDP mm -hmm. board, and I think some of what we like one of the decisions we made is we don't have a strategic plan right now. We've chosen to kind of try a bunch of experiments and see right. how they, towards a vision of growth. So so that's one concrete example, but mm -hmm. yeah, so I don't know if that answers the, the, yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. The, one, of, one of the comments I have, Andrew, is that complexity is increasing. So this diagram is drawn in that proportion. Order is actually pretty small. Mm -hmm. And order is small because we impose those constraints on it. But every time that you and I meet, like today, my personal complexity level goes up. And every time you meet somebody else, you go to a party, whatever, complexity just is always increasing. There is that feeling that, yeah, the world is getting more complex, don't disagree. But we do like order, because that's how things get done in many respects as well. That's why I'm really advocating. We need to do both and here. We can't just do mm. shift over to complex. No. And those people that say there, everything is complex. That is true if you look at it from a complex adaptive system with these three subsystems within. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the greater challenge is where people are trying to drag everything into a quadrant where it doesn't fit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. 
A good example right now is a decision for Siri. Do they go RCMP or do they go Siri Police Service? I'd love to be able to sit down with them, do a Kinevin map and say, for each individual, show me where you are right now. And that would be a conversation piece because some people say, well, we're in a complicated. This is a simple benefit cost analysis. Boom. Mm -hmm. Some people go here. No, we have not talked to all the stakeholders. We need more information. Bingo. Yeah. Me? I'd probably be, I'm in the middle confused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. That's why we have politicians to think for us in very simplistic terms. <laughs> the yeah. Election cycle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thanks again, Gary, for putting together the presentation. Okay. okay. Thanks, Thanks so much, Gary. Thanks, Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.